Lamar is locked up. There's a new offensive coordinator and several new wide receivers. Can the Baltimore Ravens go on a deep run in 2023? It's Ravens Day, and we're breaking them down from every angle today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are locked on NFL scouting with the Draft Dude, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you. The Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'd like to thank you for making Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every day. And, of course, a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. Of course, you know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Joe, happy Wednesday. Happy hump day. Um, I get my my gripe today. Is it raining at the beach for you? Is it still uh, it raining? Rained, it rained last night, but we're we're clear until about 7 p.m. tonight. Oh, okay. So, but I mean, that's not a bad schedule, yeah, right? Okay. I want to okay. wish, I want to wish everybody a happy hump day with the exception of whoever decided when you sell powdered products to put your coupon in the bottom of the bin, mm. like it's a cereal toy um, in a piece of plastic wrap. So that's like my protein powder. And yeah. I, I won't name the brand here for two reasons because no free pub, right? Hashtag right. no free pub. But then also I, I I like this powder, but I don't like getting to the bottom and then having to reach in and fish out the coupon. And then I got to like flick the coupon off to get all the powder off. So it doesn't make it mess when I set yeah. it out. Um, it seems like a pretty inefficient way to store stash a coupon in your packaging. A skewer is your friend. Not that that's great, but um, a, a lot skewer. of times even the scoop, right? Like the scoop is buried in there. You got to kind of find it. I get a skewer like that you would use to like, you know, grill with. Skewer. Poke around in there, you can find it, man. That's 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 my go-to, um, but very frustrating. There, situation. there is one brand who wedges it into the opening of the top. The scoop or the coupon? Yeah, the scoop. Well, that's a thank you for that brand. I, I'm not you, familiar with them. You would think, but they're also the ones that put the coupon down. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> so you just, just can't it, have it all, Kyle. Take, right? Yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But uh, we're talking about the Ravens here today on this episode of Locked On NFL Scouting. Our goal is to. Um, be as objective of the team as possible. Uh, we've put teams or put the players in buckets such as roster cornerstone, quality starter, adequate starter, rookies, incomplete evaluations, uh, replacement level players, practice squad caliber players, so on and so forth. And um, Baltimore is obviously a fascinating team. They've drafted a ton of talent over the last three years in the NFL draft. So they have a lot of young talent. They've had this talent in the pipeline and have kind of been building them up to bigger opportunities. I think you look at the edge rush group and the cornerback group, and you see a lot of the, even the tight end room. And I think you see a lot of players that are relatively inexperienced, but are going to be playing critical roles for this Baltimore team. And I think it makes for this uh, fascinating discussion and in the midst of an identity change offensively and the recommitment to Lamar Jackson, there's a lot here. So well, offensively, where do you want to start? I want to start with Lamar Jackson getting a chance to play football in the NFL with a offensive coordinator not, not named Greg Roman, and that being Todd Monken. And the excitement that I get from that, um, you know, I feel like Greg Roman ran his course in Baltimore and, you know, to his credit, uh, was able to engineer some very productive offenses, MVP season for Lamar, um, really tailored the scheme around Lamar, but I think we're all wondering, well, is there more? Can Lamar do more or was he restricted by Greg Roman and the ideology that he employed and kind of lack of consistent receiving talent? So Lamar Jackson with a new look offense um, with Odell Beckham Jr., with Zay Flowers to go with what we hope is a healthy Rashad Bateman, Mark Andrews, you say, okay, mm -hmm. all right, we can really kind of finally get some questions answered here. Um, but obviously, like you said, the recommitment, it's been made, right? This team is locked in with Lamar. We don't have to have those conversations anymore. I felt like they lingered for a couple of years, a couple of years of 
unfortunate late season injuries for Lamar Jackson that hurt, right? I mean, just you want him to be available in those critical moments down the stretch and in the playoffs. And we're watching Tyler Huntley in the playoffs for multiple years in a row. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious to kind of see what this looks like with Todd Munkin, with these receivers, with Lamar seemingly reinvigorated as his team's quarterback. I think that that's, I had a hard time with Lamar. I, I had a hard time putting Lamar in a bucket because the commitment that you've made now says this is a roster cornerstone player. And Lamar has showcased, he was MVP in 2019, amongst the rarest and most high impact of starting quarterbacks in the NFL when things were right. Well, schematically, things have been stale for what, would you say, three years? And I know he started well last year. Yeah. Like first month to six weeks of the season last year, Lamar was one of the most impressive EPA performers in, in the league from a quarterback standpoint. But as that season wore on, you know, even before the injury happened, his pace slowed down. I felt like the was it the Buffalo game was kind of like the first pickup where they they kind of collapsed late in that football game, and there were some opportunities for Baltimore to make plays in the second half, and it just didn't happen. Yeah, well, I mean, they had a couple of collapses. The Miami game, of course. The Bills game, I think, more from Lamar. The eight in that game or whatever it was. So yeah. I don't hold that one against Lamar too much. Rainy conditions, yeah. I mean, interception late. I thought it was the right read. I thought Jordan Poyer was late. He kind of hanged the ball up there. Big interception in the red zone on a fourth and goal. Yeah, I mean, he certainly had fence had much sync to it. Um, But putting Lamar in a bucket, when you factor in the injuries, the scheme change, and you foil that with what he's been when he's been really, really good, and the financial commitment, it, it, it was one of the hardest classifications that I have had. Because I kind of don't know. Like, it, it, yeah. there's two pathways that this comes. And yes, you unlock the next level of Lamar Jackson, and he's a slam dunk, no questions, ask roster cornerstone. But what happens if this is a Russ Wilson in Seattle type situation where they were so committed to the ideology because they felt very convicted in the strengths and weaknesses of the player and didn't want to ask him to be something that they ultimately felt that he was not. And then you saw Russell go to Denver and was not the same kind of quarterback that he was for so long in Seattle because he was no longer, he was asked to be more than what, he was probably best equipped to be. I think that we'll get answers with Lamar this year, but yeah. there was just a lot there that made classifying him based off the last two years and not knowing what this year is going to look like very challenging. The trajectory just is challenging, Kyle. I mean, he comes in as this revelation as a rookie. MVP was a 2019. That was year two, right? Yeah. So same yeah. coach, same head coach and offensive coordinator. And you have this trajectory that's like this. And then all of a sudden it plateaus and maybe even goes down a little bit. Like you don't expect that to be a normal course of action for a player that's um and a, one who was so good in 2019. Right, right. I like this offensive line. Um yeah. Good. Welcome back, Ronnie Stanley. Good to see you. It's been a while. Uh Tyler Lunderbaum, you look like you're gonna be a real revelation for this team at center. Kevin Zeitler just is like a the ultimate stalwart at guard in the NFL. I'm surprised he's been on as many teams as he has, right? I mean, just right as reliable as they come. Morgan Moses is a you know very sufficient level starter at right tackle. You just kind of have to figure figure out left guard, and you've got some contenders, right? Whether it's Ben Cleveland, John Simpson, uh, the Oregon rookie whose name is very hard to pronounce, Daniel Falele, got some run there at minicamp. <laughs> That's a smart call. Well, I don't need the pronunciation police because they they have no grace. They have no grace. Whether no. it's a foreign name, weird pronunciation, nobody cares. The pronunciation police will put the cuffs on you um, for any reason whatsoever. So uh, we'll go with the Oregon rookie and make sure I avoid them uh, this time around. But, I mean, if you just have to kind of figure out one piece and it's your left guard and they're going to play between Linderbaum and Stanley – um, okay, and we got some options. So uh, can we, can I, like, I like this in unit. That spot. Oh, that's why haven't I thought of that? That might be the best plan. Just play him at left guard. He'll yeah, be great. If Ben Cleveland's not ready, like obviously Ben Cleveland was a mid round draft selection, and I, I think that there was there there's some upside there to go into that's not there with guys like John Simpson, and I think Daniel Faalele is probably much better suited at 
tackle, even though we've talked to some people with league personnel experience who would not be surprised to see him play guard. Uh, Makari, I think, is your most attractive high floor player if you want a high floor player in there. Can you explain J.K. Dobbins to me? And not necessarily because no, I can't. Okay, so like when he's when he's <laughs> when he's on the field, he's okay, right? He's a pretty good running he's back, right? Fine running back, yeah. But like this guy's acting like he's Saquon Barkley. Just like Hold, holding out and skipping mandatory minicamp for a new contract when we rush, we have 92 rushes in the last two seasons. And they all came last year because he missed all of 2021. <laughs> My guy, my guy is well, not trying. What to, is going on? To his credit, he averages 5.9 yards per rush for his career. So when he touches the ball, he's pretty darn good. But, I mean, he had 99 touches from scrimmage last year. So over the last two years. Baltimore, when you miss all but eight games in the last two years and Baltimore has to play without you, you're – not really going to have a very strong leg to stand on to justify. I'm going to make you keep playing without me. If you don't give me a new contract, cause they're going to say, okay. Yeah. We're kind of used to that. We're, we're going to play the last two years. You've had 90 something carries. Right. What do you think about this wide receiver core? Obviously Mark Andrews has to be part of that conversation. Isaiah likely certainly some big flashes, but do we finally have the pass catchers that Lamar needs? I think we have pass catchers to give us some clarity. Um, bait Bateman's really, I don't want to say it's you to water, get off the pot time, but I would love to see him fully realize his potential coming out of Minnesota. I think having a player like Odell Beckham, whatever that looks like, right? <laughs> Cause speaking of players who have missed time, uh, Odell has not played a lot of football the last two years either. So, Having Rashad Bateman be in a position where I think he's a really good route runner, I was surprised at his open field speed. I got to see it firsthand when he ripped one off against the Dolphins and killed him for like a 75-yard touchdown catch and run on a slant, took it to the house. Um, I think the explosiveness is there. I think the route running's there. It's just you you just have to be available. Yeah. And I guess the good news is is Baltimore, you look at the other pieces that they have, I think Nelson Aguilar's a really quiet, useful depth player for this receiver room for them as somebody who in Philadelphia was asked to do a lot as a first round pick and then went to New England and, and never really lived up to the contract that he was given. But nevertheless, that's a player who has caught meaningful footballs. And when you transpose that against Devin Duvernay and James Brochet and Tylan Wallace, who are like, these are all ideally slot guys, right? And with varying degrees of upside, I think Aguilar is a better outside receiver than any of those names. I think Zay Flowers is kind of the big wild card for what he can give you right away. But I think you have the threat of athleticism now to space the field at a much greater degree of difficulty to defend than just, well, we need to bracket Mark Andrews and spy the quarterback and force these non-dynamic outside receivers to beat us on the outside. I don't think they'll have that problem. So I think it'll be yeah. very helpful to get the clarity. All right, as we continue today's conversation centered around the Baltimore Ravens, first, we need to tell you about FanDuel. Baseball season is in full swing, and there's simply no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Folks, I love betting over at FanDuel. They have great promotions every day. It's a safe, secure, easy-to-use app. And there's so much that you can get in on, of course, baseball. But how about the football's futures bets? Maybe you want to get in on the over-under for win totals for the Baltimore Ravens, or you like a certain player pop as a prop as it relates to rushing, passing, receiving stats. Maybe you think Bateman's going to have a big year. Go put some money down on it over at FanDuel. Don't miss your chance to snag that first bet up to $1,000 and no sweat because you get those bonus bets back. So just join FanDuel today. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Okay, Joseph, it's time to talk about the defense. And when I talk about the defense, my biggest question 
or my biggest observation, I should say, is probably the best way to put it, is what veteran edge rusher are we going to sign in free agency mm -hmm. next month? Because I think we got to get one. Well, they're familiar with a couple of the options in Yannick Ngakwe <laughs> and <laughs> Jason Pierre-Paul and Justin Houston. So maybe one of them you can give them, you know, phone a friend here. And, but yeah, I mean, they're they're leaning in. They have a lot of youth, right? That's that's true. I mean, Odafe Owe, David Ajabo. Uh, I'm excited Davis for Robinson. Ajabo. I'm excited for Ajabo. Tyus Bowser's kind of been a steady player for them, but what do you know that you have amongst that group? It's a question. And I don't, I don't know that the, I'm a little worried about the light bulb coming on for Oway as a pass rusher. He's always going to be very athletic, right? But that's, that's not going to get it done. Right. Yeah, the art of that? rushing the passer. Right. And even a is a little bit more of a different player. You know, for Ajabo was, I don't think, as diverse as Aiden Hutchinson coming out of Michigan last year in the draft process before he got hurt. Uh, but I didn't think Ajabo, while being a little bit more one-dimensional, showcased kind of some edge explosiveness that Owe, Owe was a little bit more of a heavy-handed athletic type who played in more tighter alignments at Penn State. And I just... I don't like how that's profiling right now. So you'd love to continue to have veterans in that room and help to try to pull that out of him. But you look at the edge rush group in a vacuum, Tyus Bowser's the most experienced guy. Mm -hmm. So for now, for now, yeah, go sign somebody because you're, you're contending in a very competitive division. You need to help. Yeah. Was, is my observation. What about the interior guys? I mean, Michael Pierce, we know what he can be as an A-gap defender, but I think there's this trio of young players that really intrigue me um, in no particular order. Travis Jones, Justin Matabuik, and Broderick Washington. Now, Travis Jones. Put him in order. Well, Travis Jones is the youngest of them, um, and I, I really like the ceiling there. I enjoyed him at UConn, and obviously really big, really explosive dude. Um, I think he's in a great situation to unlock his potential. But Matabuik in, in Washington – you know, I think at, at a minimum, they're quality depth players right now. But I wonder if there's a little bit more ceiling for them uh, to tap into. I mean, obviously, they, they're they going to have as, the most opportunity that they're ever going to have to play a lot of meaningful snaps for this front. They've been flashy. They've had good moments. But, you know, now it's kind of their time to make their mark on this defense. And I think that really paves the way for these guys to to have a big role and make plays. And I think a lot of the success of this front is going to hinge on those three guys. Yeah, you know, I, I think getting Pierce and Travis Jones on the field at the same time can also yield some really, really good results for you. So you ain't running the ball. You ain't, there's nowhere to no, go. No, but I think Jones is athletic enough to kind of push out and live in the B gap at times. Yeah, where you're talking about both Matt Abweek and, and Broderick Washington, and you know they were kind of angular. What, both Texas kids, right? Matt Abweek was K and M, and Washington &M and was Tech. Tech yeah. was Texas Tech. Yeah, so. Uh, both kind of angular 290 pound interior defensive linemen coming out of college. And, and I, I think they have showcased enough growth where you feel good about them being maybe low ceiling interior guys. I, I think there is some athleticism there that, that as you said, you can maybe kind of get to a point where you love those guys as starters in like non super disruptive roles in your defense. But I think Travis Jones can do it all. I think Michael Pierce is one of the better nose tackles in football. So having that presence there, as long as they're both available, I think you can get some disruption up front with Travis Jones. And no, not not to sleep on the versatility of the edge group. Say what you will about the pass rush ceiling, but Owe is a guy who can reduce down and play in a, a five mm -hmm. if you need him to. Uh, I think Tyus Bowser is somebody who can drop off. If you want to run over and under fronts with – with that edge group pairing and, and have Bowser kind of drop off into space in some zone coverage looks or simultaneously rush the passer. That's a nice chess piece for them that maybe we can get some of Trenton Simpson involved with as well. Question mark. Well, I think that's he's probably your long-term answer to Patrick queen. If you're not going to re-extend him. 
Yeah, I, I think we learned a lot about their plan at linebacker when they did draft Trenton Simpson. They declined the fifth year option on Patrick Queen after he had yeah. his best season. And then, of course, what they gave to Roquan Smith in terms of that trade and then the money committed. 20 mil. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think there's a an ideal path, right? But I think what's interesting is Patrick Queen, what he does this year, right? I mean, he's still on this team in a contract year, an ascending young talent who came into the NFL pretty under repped, right? I mean, just a, yeah. a handful Roll. of games started. So uh, we're unsurprised that it took a little time, but what is, you know, how does he parlay year three into year four, which is a contract year for him and, and just a really dynamic athlete that continues to kind of get better. It's, it's an interesting situation. I think obviously Roquan Smith with they with what they committed to him says a lot about, you know, him kind of being the face of this defense moving forward, but you kind of think about this this secondary, and obviously, you know, Marcus Williams is timeout. A, a timeout. All timeout. right. Baltimore is a top blank linebacker room in the NFL. Uh, my my internet blips, so I heard you say Baltimore. Baltimore has a top blank linebacker room in the NFL. Mm, probably top five. The numbers agree with you, but I did just to quantify that because we, we talked about the front and we talked about the pass rush room. We have some questions. And then I think yeah, as you were transitioning to the secondary, there's some youth there that I think creates some high variance forecasts for them. So I thought it, thought it was just worth acknowledging the quality of Roquan Smith as a cornerstone and, Patrick Queen is a quality starter and uh, Trenton Simpson is a rookie and Malik Harrison is kind of the big physical player in that group. Uh, they, they score pretty favorably on the second level. They should. I like that group. Um, so the secondary, you know, obviously Marcus Williams was such a great addition to them. Uh, re restoring kind of that one high safety that really can improve your spacing overall, a ball Hawk back there. We know what Marlon Humphrey is as a you know top tier corner that, it's interesting for a while there, he was playing a lot more in the slot. I've noticed they're playing him a lot more in, in as a wide corner, which, you know, I think he's versatile. You can play him wherever you need to, and he can do anything that you want. Um, Rocky Sin comes over. I think it gives him a baseline starter uh, at one spot, but I think they still need another corner here to kind of emerge. And I don't know if that's going to be Jalen Armour Davis. I, I feel like the mini camp reports on him have been pretty poor. You know, Brandon Stevens was a fairly high draft pick recently. Demarion Williams, it's Caillou Blue, Blue Kelly. Kelly. It's going to be Caillou. I wouldn't be surprised, man. Uh, that was kind of where I was building. But you have the one of those four guys. One of those four guys has to kind of step up here because they're going to play a ton of snaps. And it would not surprise me if Caillou Blue Kelly is that guy. He's, he feels like a raven to me with how physical he is, uh, man coverage skills. There's some ball production there from his time at Stanford. I think they're going to like him as kind of a legacy player, right? They're going to like those genes that he has to emerge as a, a guy that commands a lot of snaps here in this secondary. Yeah, and, the, and then obviously having a player as versatile as Kyle Hamilton as a second-year player is very, very helpful as well. Uh, I know this time last year, everybody was freaking out about Kyle Hamilton because he got cooked in like their their scrimmage or whatever it was yeah. and one-on-one -on -one coverage that somebody filmed a couple reps on their cell phone and he got beat deep and everybody's losing their minds at four, six safety and can't cover him and covers. It's like, okay, well, yeah. Turns out if you put a player in positions to do the things he does well, he's going to be just fine. And Hamilton was somebody who we'll talk a little bit about here in segment three in just a minute. Um, as far as what buckets he's close to, we have him as an incomplete evaluation right now as a second year player, but that versatility on the back end, I think is a really, really fun piece of the puzzle when you're talking about does Baltimore want to live in a world where they have the versatility of Tyus Bowser and Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen on the second level and stay in base and kind of like, is there a more athletic duo of linebackers right now in the NFL? No, no chance. Like you have Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw is athletic, but he's not. CJ Mosley and, and Quincy Williams are kind of in that conversation, but I think this is the most dynamic coverage combo. And then if you stay in, in, in your base looks and you have Tyus Bowser out there, he can again, do a lot of things and Kyle Hamilton can do a lot of things. So 
Um, I I think they're positioned okay to play against 11 personnel in other ways, but I do agree with you at, at the core of this discussion between these second-year corners and Caillou Blue Kelly. Somebody's got to step up and be ready to go. All right, as we continue our conversation today on the Baltimore Ravens, we're going to come to consensus after a very quick break. Okay, Joe, we have to come to consensus on Tyler Linderbaum. <laughs> that's our right. that's our one. Okay. Um, I had him as an incomplete evaluation. Mm-hmm. You had him as a blank. I had him as a quality starter. Quality starter. Yeah. Okay. Um, if Tyler Linderbaum plays the way that he did last year. Mm -hmm. his classification is what? Quality starter. So if he has two years of level of play that he put on tape last year, you wouldn't consider him to be a roster cornerstone? Oh, see, you baited me. No, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I just asked the question. Well, I would extend the same question to other players that are like this. Like We did this with Iki Iquanu. We did this with Charles Cross, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, did we? Did we do the Seahawks yet? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Charles Cross is incomplete. And didn't we move Icky? We talked about that. We said that was going to be like our. I don't know. Let's look at other other rookie offensive linemen who were meaningful starters. Josh For or Luke Fortner got an incomplete evaluation. Not a good example anyway. Zion Johnson. Kenyon Green. Charles this is Cross what I'll say is an is, incomplete evaluation. As long as the points, I don't care what the classification is, as long as they get quality points for having Tyler Linderbaum as their starter. Okay. That's all so I'm then, asking for. So me. then that's where this discussion needs to go because there's a number of these players that have to be defined for Baltimore because there's a lot of pink on this list, aka a lot of incomplete evaluations. A lot of young players. So let's start with Tyler Linderbaum. I would agree with you that would be a quality the level of play that he put on the field last year was that of a quality starter at center. Okay. But if he does it again and it's two years running and he's a young player to rookie contract, then I would make the argument that at this time next year, he's a roster cornerstone. All right. I dig it. Okay. How about Kyle, Ham Kyle Hamilton's prior our, our next lowest hanging fruit. So I would embrace that. I, I think that Kyle Hamilton got better and better throughout the course of the year, and I think that just comes with the Ravens becoming more intimately aware of his skill set and how to deploy him, and through that, they got a lot of impact as the season moved along. So I think the trajectory here is really, really good. Um, and, for, and for congruency there, we gave Kirby Joseph an incomplete evaluation as well. Same type deal. And it's the same type deal where the ball production was really strong with Kirby Joseph. And I think Kyle Hamilton, as you said, and like the tackling was good. Incomplete evaluation. But if you had to put him in a bucket, because it was more of a progression as the year went on, I would agree with you. Yellow, adequate starter. Adequate starter is probably the bucket that you would give Kyle Hamilton right now with the expectation that he is a quality starter if he continues to build upon the way he was playing at the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. And you got Bateman. You got right. Oway. Well, Bateman's just about staying healthy. And because it feels like when he is healthy, he's able to produce, which is pretty impressive given the, his age, given the lack of weapons that have been around him. You know, for him to be able to be pretty consistent when he's available is impressive, but he's got to be available. I mean, is it Bateman's averaging 40, about 45 yards per game thus far in his first two seasons? It's pretty solid, but he only caught 15 balls last year in six games. Yeah. Um, Oway. Oway for me is between an adequate level starter on early downs and a, a quality depth player. I would agree. I just don't think the ceiling's there for you to be like, yeah, this, this is a plus starter for you with what he is right now. 
right? I mean, he's just got to develop the art of rushing the passer. It's all athleticism for him right now, and that's good, right? If you if you if you play hard and you're super athletic, you can you have a chance, right, to make some plays behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, it's becoming more aware of how to attack the pocket and use his physical gifts to beat blocks. I think is really going to allow him to take his game to the next level or not. Well, and you say athleticism, but this isn't just athleticism. This is 260 that ran 436 with a 11-2 yeah, broad jump and a 6833 cone drill and a 40-yard vertical, right? Like that's not going to guarantee you're going to be a good football player. But that is a baseline that's going to get you on the field. The light bulb on passing downs just has to come on. And it's not like he hasn't played snaps. He played over right. 1,200 snaps or, yeah, 1,200 snaps in the yeah. first two seasons. Right. That's what made it hard for me to put him as a pink because there is a sample size here. But asking yourself the question, do we know what he is? I don't think it it's conclusive. Well, and that, that exact question, I think, does apply to Lamar Jackson, too, who we discussed in segment one. Yeah. So I know you and I both came in and we both put him as a quality starter. But for congruency's sake, I think it's at least worth asking the question if we're sure that's where we want to put him. I just feel like there's more to learn. I would agree with you. The the cornerstone, roster cornerstone quarterbacks that we have given thus far. I'll read them to you, okay? And you tell me if this is the right stratosphere or if he belongs in the other stratosphere. Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Dak Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Aaron Rodgers, Jalen Hurts. It's right there on the fringe. Right. I think the the one that he has the most compelling argument against is probably Dak Prescott. that, That stood out to me as well. Meanwhile, your quality starters right now are like Kirk Cousins, Geno Smith, Tua Tungavaloa, Jared Goff. Fringe. The good news is we'll we'll have a chance to revisit that specifically because when we grade the quarterbacks, we grade the quarterbacks differently. And the quarterbacks is you rank them one through 32 and you get prorated points based off of that. I think there's maybe one name in the cornerstone bucket that you would say, yeah, I would rank in front of Lamar Jackson right now. But again, it's the, it's the incomplete nature of the scheme change, a very significant ideological change with kind of plateaued play the last two years and the, um, the injuries. So you have like this chicken or the egg debate with Lamar that I think is probably not as relevant with some of the other cornerstone players. And look, if he goes out and plays to his potential this year, he's going to be back in the cornerstone. Like this is not a kiss of death. Like we think Lamar no. Jackson's a bad investment or anything like that. It's just, there, there are so many layers here that really made it difficult for us to reconcile. Yep. I think it's a p- completely fair way to look at it. And, um, the Ravens are certainly operating as if he's the cornerstone, right? Correct. And so, I mean, that says a lot. And, you know, I, I think that they're very optimistic, obviously, about what this can look like moving forward. And um, hopefully there's a just a renewed approach and it works out because he's special. He's a special player and this offense can be really, really good. It could be the best version of it that we've seen. And hopefully we are optimistic that you all will come back and see us again tomorrow. I'm Kyle Krabs. He's Joe Marino. We are Locked On FL Scouting Podcast. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We appreciate you for making us a part of your day. Hit subscribe. Come on back and see us again soon. We are out of here. Peace.